Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. One of the most magnificent 19th century military expeditions conquered no new lands. You won't find it mentioned in many history books, but because of the monumental logistics, military historians compare the landing in Ethiopia in 1868 to the Allies' invasion of France in 1944. For four years, Emperor Theodore III of Ethiopia had held a group of 53 European captives, 30 adults and 23 children, including some missionaries and a British consul he held them in a remote 9,000 foot high bastion deep in the interior. By letter, Queen Victoria pleaded in vain with Theodore to release the captives. Finally, the government ordered a full-scale military expedition from India to march into Ethiopia, not to conquer the country or to make it a British colony, but simply to rescue a tiny band of civilians. The invasion force included 32,000 men, heavy artillery, and 44 elephants to carry the guns. Provisions included 50,000 tons of beef and pork. Engineers built landing piers, water treatment plants, a railroad and telegraph line to, to the interior, plus many bridges. All of this to fight one decisive battle, after which the prisoners were released and set free. The British expended much time, effort, and millions of pounds to rescue these captives. For us, captives, to be rescued and set free from the bondage of our sins, an infinitely great price was paid as the Son of God willingly and humbly left heaven's glory to become a man and to be the sinner's Savior. And in infinite love and grace, He died for us. The next major event of the Bible that we will look at is the cross. Matthew 27, 45 to 49 reads, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. The gospel accounts divide the six hours of Christ's crucifixion into two parts, the first three hours and the second three hours. Christ was crucified at the third hour, or 9 a.m., so Christ's crucifixion is divided between 9 a.m. and noon, and noon to 3 p.m. Christ had been on the cross for three hours when darkness suddenly came over all the land from the sixth hour, or noon, until the ninth hour, or 3 p.m. Our Lord was born at night under the cover of darkness, yet when the angels announced His birth to the shepherds, a supernatural light broke the darkness, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, because the light had come into the dark world. Just as a supernatural light pierced the darkness of the night at His birth, a supernatural darkness overshadowed the light of day at His death. And at noon, when the sun was at its zenith, an astounding miracle was done by God, which was God's commentary on the events. One moment the sun was shining overhead, the next moment everything went dark. And this was a heaven-sent, sudden, and sustained darkness. It became as dark as midnight in the middle of the day, without any hint of light from the sun, and it stayed that way for three hours. In Scripture, this was not something unusual for God to do to interfere with the sun. He had done it on several other occasions. It showed that as God, He could do what He wanted with the sun, 
and that as creator, he is infinitely greater than the sun. In Joshua's time, the Lord made the sun stand still for a whole 24-hour period so Israel could complete a victory in battle over the Amorites. In Hezekiah's day, God caused the sun to move backwards so that it moved backward on the sundial 10 degrees. On another occasion in Egypt, God blackened the sun as one of the plagues and created a darkness in Egypt that Exodus describes as a darkness which may be felt. And here at the cross, at noon, Luke 23, 45 says the sun was darkened. In other words, it's like God turned the sun off. This was supernatural darkness, a divine miracle, and the whole earth was darkened. Darkness in your Bible is a symbol of judgment and wrath. God's salvation is referred to as light. But God's judgment is symbolized by darkness. For example, the time of God's judgment being poured out on the earth in the tribulation period is described as a time of thick darkness. And during those seven years, the sun will be darkened. At the fourth trumpet judgment in the tribulation, a third of the sun's light will be removed. Later, at the fifth bold judgment, God completely darkens the sun. And at the second coming, the sun will be darkened. And the lake of fire is a place of eternal judgment, and thus it is called outer darkness, and the blackness of darkness forever. And here at the cross, the darkness teaches that God was judging our sins in Christ during these three hours. All our sins were placed upon him, our substitute, and he was made sin for us. And then God poured out his divine wrath on him, and he took the judgment we deserved. In those three hours were compressed the full measure of God's righteous wrath against all our sins. And in those three hours, Christ paid the price, settled the debt, and the Father was completely and eternally satisfied by His Son's perfect sacrifice for our sins. Our Savior took all our judgment in that utter darkness so that we might be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light and be light in the Lord. At the end of this three-hour period of darkness, the Lord cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As Christ bore the weight of the sin of the world, he experienced separation from the Father for the only time in all of eternity. And he cried out these words of abandonment, forsakenness, and separation in his anguish as he felt and experienced the awful terrifying forsakenness by God that we deserved for our sins. Verse 47 says that some of those that were standing there, when they heard him say, Eli, Eli, began saying, this man's calling for Elijah. But these people knew better than that. The Jews knew the name of God, Elohim or Eli. It's hard to say whether they knew that the Lord was quoting Scripture in Psalm 22, 22, 1 by His words, but hearing Him cry out, Eli, Eli, they pretended to understand that He meant Elijah. And then, then they made a joke about it. This was sarcasm, mockery, and jeering, and cruelly they're saying, He's calling for Elijah. Ha, ha, is the idea. Three hours earlier, they had mocked and said, he saved others himself he cannot save. Here, after the three hours of darkness, they mock him that because he cannot save himself, he's calling out to the old prophet to come to rescue him. At this point, according to the Gospel of John, the Lord said, I thirst. Thus, verse 48 says that one of them ran. The sponge was then filled with vinegar or cheap sour wine from a jug that was near the cross. The sponge was placed on a branch from a hyssop bush and lifted to the Lord. And thus a prophecy of the cross was fulfilled from Psalm 69. And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. In verse 49 we see those around the cross kept up the mockery. 
The Lord was mocked until the bitter end. They were keeping the Elijah joke going. They told the one who gave the Lord the drink from the branch to let be or leave him be, stand back and wait. And they said, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. These wicked observers joke saying that we, they should all stand back and watch to see if Elijah would actually come. And they anticipated that after he took that drink, he might cry out to Elijah again. And our Lord did speak after taking that drink. And he let loose the victory shout of our salvation. It is finished. Matthew 27, 50 to 51 reads, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Christ then bowed his head, the gospel of John tells us, which means he slowly and calmly lowered his head and bowed it. And unlike how we die, because he is God in the flesh, Christ yielded up the ghost, or he dismissed his spirit. And at that moment, behold, or boom, the veil of the temple tore in two, and the earth shook violently. When the tearing of the veil occurred, the temple was packed with worshipers who were there for the killing of their Passover lambs at the three o'clock evening sacrifice. By God's design, it was in the very hour that those lambs were being slain that the true Passover lamb died. Christ was the true Passover lamb whom all those other lambs just foreshadowed. And when we trust him as our savior, because God's judgment was fully poured out on his son for our sins, his judgment of eternal death passes over us. The veil of the temple was a curtain that separated the two main rooms of the temple, the holy place from the holy of holies, which was the dwelling place of God. But don't imagine a little sheer curtain for this veil. It was a very heavy, woven, thick curtain, 30 feet in height, 30 feet in width covering the entrance into the cube-shaped Holy of Holies. The veil was a barrier so that no one could go into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, could go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was and where God's presence resided in the temple. Leviticus 16 spells out the details for that high and holy day. Before entering the tabernacle, the high priest was to bathe and put on special garments. Then he was to sacrifice a bull for a sin offering for himself and his family. The blood of the bull was to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. Then Aaron was to sacrifice a goat because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins, and its blood too was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. If anyone else beside the high priest ever entered the most holy place, he would immediately die. If the high priest entered on any other day than the Day of Atonement, he would immediately be struck dead. If the high priest came in without blood, he would immediately perish. Everything about the Mosaic system in the Holy of Holies screamed, Stop! Stay away! Don't come near! You are not qualified to come on your own. The veil was a giant roadblock, making sure that no one came into God's presence. That thick veil was symbolic of the fact that people were shut out of God's presence and a constant reminder that sin renders humanity unfit for the presence of God and thus there was a separation from God because of our sin. But the moment Christ died, showing God was completely satisfied with Christ's shed blood and payment for sin forever, God himself ripped that veil from top to bottom. It was as though a large sword from heaven had been dropped upon it. And the torn veil, torn from top to bottom, was from the living God to sinful men. That veil didn't tear just a little bit at a time. It was instantaneous and immediate when Christ died, God ripped that 
thick veil wide open at that moment. And God the Father was declaring, he was preaching a sermon to mankind without words when he tore that curtain from top to bottom in two. The tearing of that veil symbolized the permanent opening of access to God through Christ's shed blood and that the barrier to him had been removed. He was showing that he was well pleased with Christ's sacrifice, agreeing with Christ's words that it is finished and that the way of access into his presence was now available to all. Ephesians 2.18 and chapter 3, verse 12, our apostle reminds us of this blessing for through him or Christ, we both are Jew and Gentile have access by one spirit unto the father and in whom or Christ we have boldness and access with confidence by tearing by God tearing that veil it shows that he made the way to come directly to him we don't get there by our weak efforts or our good works or our supposed good life that's filled with sin we get there by the power and might of God's provision for sin through his son at the cross which takes all of our sins away as far as the east is from the west, the moment we trust him as our personal savior. That veil was a symbol of the body of the savior. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 says, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. When Christ gave his body in death and his body was torn by his sacrifice on the cross, the veil was torn and the way was forever opened into the presence of God. Through his death and shed blood, now all believers can enter God's presence in prayer and praise at any time with direct access to the throne of grace, free unobstructed access to God is always open to every believer in Christ. And when we pass from this life at death, we know we are welcome in his presence. And that torn veil is an assurance of that fact. At the same time as the tearing of the veil, a great earthquake took place. An earthquake, the force of which split rocks in two. The death of Christ was a miraculous, powerful, earthquake, earth-shaking event. God shook the earth the moment his son died. The strength of the quake was such that rocks were split. Rocks were not cracked or had hairline fractures. Instead, boulders and rocks split apart in two and fell apart in pieces. The power of the earthquake was in response to the Savior's final shout of victory in line with the magnitude and power and significance of the death to which it testified. Christ's death was victory, and the earthquake bore testimony to how monumental this event was. It also reminds us that at the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19:18 tells us that the whole mountain quaked greatly, but now... Christ blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The earthquake at Mount Calvary signified that the demands of the law given at Mount Sinai had been met, and the curse of the law, which was judgment and death, was taken away. The broken law, which rightly accused, indicted, and condemned us, was nailed to his cross, and Christ paid our sin debt in full. He took away all the law's power to condemn us. The significance of the cross and its ramifications are such that it deserved for the earth to move and shake when Christ died because the cross changed everything. Anytime you have an earthquake, everything stops. It stops people in their tracks. And the earthquake at Christ's death was God's way of saying to the world, Stop! Look! Listen! My son died for you. 
Look to the cross and you will find my salvation. Matthew 27, 52 to 54 read, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Here we further learn that the great earthquake caused the stones in front of the tombs of many saints around Jerusalem to break in half and to move away. So the interior of these rocky graves were opened and there was an unobstructed view inside. For three days, these tombs remained open. Because of the Sabbaths which followed the day Christ died, those in Jerusalem couldn't do anything about closing them up again. Then verse 53 tells us that after the resurrection of Christ, the occupants of these tombs were raised and they went into Jerusalem where they appeared to many. We are not told who these people were, but just that they were saints or believers who had died. Many saints were raised, but not all were. These were select representatives of the saints buried in and around Jerusalem. But can you imagine those knocks at doors around Jerusalem on resurrection morning when they opened their door to find their formerly deceased loved one greeting them? There was a lot of shock and awe in that day. The saints gave testimony to the death-destroying, life-giving power of Jesus Christ. John Owens once spoke about the death of death and the death of Christ, and these saints demonstrated that truth. John Walvoord wrote this of these resurrections. This event was a fulfillment of the feast of the first fruits of harvest mentioned in Leviticus 23. On that occasion, as a token of the coming harvest, the people would bring a handful of grain to the priest. The resurrection of these saints occurring after Jesus himself was raised is a token of the coming harvest when all the saints will be raised. Their staggering appearances and resurrections after Christ's resurrection prove that Christ had conquered sin and death for the saints. And it prefigured how one day, as John 5, 28 says, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. The torn veil shows Christ conquered sin. The earthquake shows he paid for the broken law, and the resurrections prove that he triumphed over death. There were many miracles on the day Christ died. The darkness, the tearing of the veil, the earthquake, and another significant miracle is the reaction of the centurion and the other Roman soldiers around the cross. A Roman centurion was the commander of a century, or a hundred-man division of soldiers. He was a proven leader of men. Because this officer was with the soldiers guarding Christ, it seems clear that he had been given charge of overseeing and carrying out the crucifixion of Christ and the crucifixion of the two thieves as well. Christ's death was unlike any crucifixion the centurion or any of those other Roman soldiers had ever witnessed. But notice it says that they were watching Jesus. Thus, they heard him pray for forgiveness for those who had him crucified. They saw the noble way he suffered and how he did not retaliate toward those who mocked him. They heard his kindness to one of the thieves crucified with him, and they heard his kindness toward his mother. They experienced the three hours of eerie, thick darkness. They heard when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. They heard him say, it is finished. And when he slowly bowed his head and died, they experienced the powerful earthquake that took place that split rocks and opened graves. And verse 40, 54 says that they all feared greatly, understandably. They could no longer ignore the fact that Christ was indeed the Son of God. And thus the centurion, as well as all the other soldiers, began saying that, Truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this was the Son of God. 
And thus another miracle of the cross was that those who started the day abusing him finished the day praising him. God touched the sun and darkness came over the earth. God touched the temple and the veil was torn. God touched the earth and it quaked and rocks split apart. God touched the graves and the saints were raised three days later. God touched the soldiers and they gave a testimony to his son. God punctuated the cross with miracles to show that this was indeed the son of God. And as God's son, he was more than able to pay for all our sins. And it shows that he alone is the only savior, the only way to God. In the miracles of Calvary, we see the miracle of salvation that Christ accomplished for us out of his amazing love, grace, and mercy. The following poem by F.W. Pitt reminds us of the significance of the cross. The maker of the universe, as man for man was made a curse, the claims of the law which he had made, unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow, which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined, in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung, the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened over his head, by him above the earth that sky was spread. The sun that hid from him its face, by his decree was poised in space. The spear that spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which, he, in which his form was laid was hone and rock his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. But a new glory crowns his brow and one day every knee to him shall bow. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.